Hello, I'm Ali Zakri Alias, and welcome to the ICLIF Leadership and Governance Centre Leaders Room. Today with us is Dr. Vasiha Hassan, and he has over 30 years of experience in the financial sector, where he has served as chairman of several boards such as RHB Islamic Bank Berhad, Unicorn International Islamic Bank Malaysia Berhad, and Utama Merchant Bank Berhad. Currently, he is a board member of Ingress Corporation Berhad and a senior associate of Cats Devery Institute London. In addition, he is a member of the International Society for the Psychoanalytic Study of Organization, USA, and a committee member of the International Clinical Coaching Organization, and served as a member of the International Advisory Panel of the World Islamic Economic Forum. He was awarded an MSc, Specialized Degree in Consulting and Coaching for Change in Clinical Psychology with honors from HEC France. He has also been awarded his PhD from Freie University Amsterdam on his thesis, The Malay Leadership Mystique, Building a Background to a Psychoanalytic Understanding of Malay Leadership Qualities in Politics and Business. And his thesis is the foundation and focus of our discussion today. Vasiha, welcome to the Leaders Room. Before we begin in our discussion, could you please share with us a, an, a quick overview of your research? Well, the, the research focuses on what I call the lack of success of Malays in business. And this was triggered uh, when I was at a Harvard Club dinner in the year 2002, when the then Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir Mohammed, had a speech entitled The New Malay Dilemma. And, in, and in, during that speech, he was highly critical of the Malays as lacking entrepreneurism and not fulfilling the government's uh, wish to bring them up on par with the other races in Malaysia and the failure of NEP, etc. So he was highly critical. As I was listening to him, it also occurred to me as much as the uh, Malays have somewhat lagged behind the other races in the field of business, but the Malays have also successfully steered the leadership, political leadership in the country. As you know, Malaysia is easily can be considered as one of the success stories of the post-independent era from the British. Eh? Very few colonial uh, I mean, very few countries from the British colonial era have been as successful as Malaysia, if you exclude Hong Kong and Singapore, which are small city-states. Uh, therefore, and there is ample uh, literature available to, to talk about Malaysia's success uh, as, a, as a nation. But the very Malays who have been the backbone of, of uh, providing the political framework for the success of the nation have also lagged in business. And this paradox is what I wanted to explore. And that's how I start, embarked on this research almost about eight years ago. Were you not a bit worried about um, talking about this subject because it's a potentially sensitive issue? Uh, so what prompted you to just keep on continuing with this and, and uh, produce your research? You see, if you see, if you notice in the research, I have not put in my opinion anywhere in the entire research. It, the whole thing is from literature survey, historical uh, readings about the Malays, contemporary writings about the Malays, as well as discussions with focus group, as well as expert panel. So I have compiled what has been said in the past and written in the past, plus what people have said about the topic of research to me during the focus group discussions, as well as expert panel interviews. So the views are not mine. I'm merely a compiler of all these things, and I'm providing this is the view from the Malays themselves. Uh, the entire research focused uh, is of the Malays and for the Malays by the Malays, eh? except for three expert panel members who happen to be non-Malays, but they were very closely involved with the Malays in certain aspects. Yeah. And some of these uh, focus group members as well as the expert panels, they are very uh, well regarded and uh, very well renowned Malaysians. Yes. 
You see, I deliberately chose people who are in the top, the, what I would call the cream de la cream of the, for the expert panel. Huh? And then for the focus group, I selected, although it was a random selection from a Bhumiputra directory of businessmen and through some help from other friends, the, the, the participants who were selected were those who were the products of NEP, those who have been successful professionally, those businessmen who were also the products of NEP, who have been successful as well as who have not been that successful. So all of them were in one way or another beneficiaries of the NEP. Therefore, they could fully understand uh, the research. And I must also tell you here that every one of the persons I interviewed from Dr. Mahadir right down to the focus group, everybody was very frank and forthcoming in their views. Nobody <coughs> uh, hid anything from me and they were in fact congratulating me for this research. They say it's a very timely research and it's something that needs to be done about the Malay situation. So I had absolute cooperation from all quarters. Uh, Leaders are often defined by their followers and as such, before we go into the topic of Malay de leadership, mm -hmm. maybe it might be useful for us to get a quick overview and description of a Malay follower. So how, how would you describe a Malay follower? You see, uh, a Malay follower, actually the Malay leaders are very lucky in the sense that the Malay followers are one of the most compliant followers across the globe. If you look at Malays, eh, they are very compliant at ceremonies. If you look at, historically also there is evidence to say when there is a royal ceremony or a palace ceremony, the Malays are very well organized and they behave very well. They know exactly where their places are and they will be seated according to their rank and hierarchy. And that uh, behavior has continued till today, which I have also mentioned in my research. When the Malays perform Hajj in Saudi Arabia, the Hajj, the Saudi authorities are full of praise for Malays as the most organized and obedient uh, pilgrims. Whereas uh, people from the African continent and the subcontinent may sometimes be you know, pushing and, and rushing towards the, but the Malays are very well organized. So, uh, Malays are very compliant followers. Probably this is partly due to the feudal things which I have discussed in my research, as well as uh, the fact that uh, the hierarchy is very strong in the Malays. Eh? So, I would say from the point of the followership, the Malays have been an extremely compliant uh, lot. And this makes leadership in this country much more easier than in many other countries. But would you also say it's a bit more complex? I mean, if we take into account the dynamics of urban, rural, as well as, I think, religion, mm -hmm. how, how would you say that that affects this whole mix? Yes, of course, urbanization uh, has created its own complexities for the Malays because until 1969, bulk of the Malays were rural. You know, there were very few Malays in the urban areas. Huh? There were, but very small percentage. And most of these Malays in the urban areas then were of mixed parentage, usually of Arab descent or Indian Muslim parentage, or those who were belonging to the elite society of the Malays, the nobility and the royalties and all that. The rest of the Malays were in rural areas. Now, bringing them out from the rural to urban has posed, of course, its, its, its complex uh, challenges as well. And also, uh, because the Malays are very staunch Muslims, uh, religion has also played, uh, we have to be extremely careful how we educate the Malays in terms of religious values. I also have mentioned in my research that uh, misguided religious beliefs have somewhat uh, distorted the Malay behavior in this country. Therefore, we need to pay a little bit of attention. I think many of our political leaders have mentioned this also. 
You also mentioned in your research that uh, like Malaysia is one of the highest power distance, uh, in fact, not only one of the highest, the, the top, highest, yes. the number one in terms of power distance, uh, mm. and I th in terms of the uncertainty, um, avoidance. avoidance of uncertainty, I think we are also quite high up there. Yes, uh, uncertainty, okay, you yeah. finish your question. No, 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 no. Uh, so please. Yeah. Uncertainty avoidance means uh, we are, we are a, a society where if there is uncertainty, we can take it without any ruffle. Uh, that is the, the, the meaning of the uncertainty avoidance. We are low in uncertainty avoidance. Is that a good thing though? It is a good thing because you, the people do not become anxious, they don't become uh, aggressive if there is an uncertainty in this country. That speaks for the Malay psychology, where they are willing to take any change with a very quiet uh, uh, manner. Yeah. That's very interesting mm. because it's normally quoted that uh, change uh, is one of the, the biggest things that human, uh, humans fear. Mm. And, and we are getting a, a different viewpoint from, from, from this research. <coughs> and how, how would you, is that an advantage, you would say, for, for the Malays? You see, for, because the Malays have been subjected to a lot of of uh, psychological pressure from historical time and they have been experiencing all sorts of, uh, of uh, issues both from the historical uh, feudal masters as well as the colonial masters eh? and probably their psyche has already been the prepared to accept changes without any ruffles. Eh? That is, I wouldn't say it's good or bad, there are pluses and minuses in a society which, which compliantly accepts changes and also of those societies which are very uh, anxious when there are changes to, to their uh, societies. Could it be one of the, you, you mentioned in your book that the Malay civilization is one of the youngest in the world where we could actually trace it back to uh, the, the, the Malacca Sultanate. That was where we could actually officially say it started mm. from, from there. Uh, and on top of that, we only had around 100 years um, of uh, uh, independence in that sense yes. before we were then colonized by the, the, the Spanish, the Por uh, Portuguese, the Dutch, the, mm. no, not the Spanish, no, the, the, uh, Spanish. the Portuguese, uh, the, the, Portuguese <laughs> the Dutch and, and the English. Mm. So would that actually add to the um, the ability for us to take changes uh, much more easily? <coughs> uh, Malays have always been subject to changes, drastic changes. Uh, historically, when the British landed here in the 1800s, there is a, a British resident who has said that we are pushing the Malays to change too fast because according to his view, when the British came here in 1800s, the, the Malays were still in the Middle Ages, the 1300s or thereabout. So he says, we are crushing into the Malays 600 years of development, which we took so long to adjust, but to the Malays we are trying to crash it within a period of 20 years. Ironically, he also used the word 20 years, which later for the NEP also was a 20-year period. This Clifford mentioned in the 1800s. So the Malays were subjected to that kind of pressure to develop. And uh, that is probably one of the reasons why they couldn't take this, but, and therefore they moved into the interior. You see, the Malays did not benefit much from the British uh, rule in this country. It only benefited the non-Malays who were brought in during the British rule, plus the nobility and the royalty who enjoyed certain privileges during the British era. The bulk of the Malays who were rural were hardly impacted by the economic development that was taking place, except the only benefit that historically Malays benefited for, from the British was the law and order, which was imposed by the British. Before that, there was slavery, there was abuse of the Malays by the nobility and the royalty, but that was stopped when the British came. Uh, and they only, the only tangible benefit that the Malays 
uh, got the, from the British was r rule, uh, law and order. How would you uh, say the added complexity of the different cultures, especially the Indian and the Chinese cultures, mm. uh, affect the, 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 the Malay followership in that sense? You see, uh, Malay culture <coughs> is also takes its root from Hindu and Buddhist culture, some of the practices that we see. And of course, the biggest influence came from Islam. Uh, but some of the Hindu and uh, Buddhist uh, cultural traits are still there. And the Malays are an all-embracing race. By nature, they are not adverse to anybody. You are welcome as long as you know your boundaries. And uh, they will be willing to collaborate with anybody as long as you recognize that they are the rightful uh, people of this land. And the moment somebody questions that, this is what I, I have called the three R's in my research, uh, race, religion, and royalty. Uh, when their race is questioned that uh, they are to share some things with the other races, they become a little bit jittery because they are not yet in, at the same level economically with the other races. And uh, unconsciously, the Malays have, this may be a little bit sensitive, but it is the truth, as, as I've uh, said in my research. Unconsciously, the Malays until today have not accepted the other races as equal citizens of this country. They feel that they are the rightful uh, people of this land and the, the other races came and they settled here. And it was the British who forced them to remain here. To that extent, the, the Malays are willing to accept and work with the other races. But when the other races start questioning about Malay privileges, that's where the sensitivity begins. And uh, this has been a, a big political issue for the political masters to handle. On one hand, they need peace and stability in the country. On the other hand, they do acknowledge this below the surface of, of, the, of the sensitivity that is going on. And so with all this complexity, how would you describe what is a Malay leader? Uh, in a research done by a project called uh, Globe Research, uh, by uh, this is the largest research done on cultural leadership across the world. Eh? In, oh, I think they did over 70 or 80 countries, and Malaysia is one of the countries. A Malay leader, according to that research, is expected to be modest, humble, and dignified. And if you notice that this has been the characteristic of the Malay leaders, and also, the Malay leaders are driven by three other <coughs> facts, or what I call three other uh, factors. One is kesetiaan, uh, that is loyalty. And the, the other side of the coin of kesetiaan is derhaka, treachery or disloyalty, or whatever you call it. And the third factor is kehalusan, uh, uh, subtlety. You see, you, you must always approach the Malays in a subtle way. And they are very willing to oblige if you use subtlety to, to win them over. A lot of successful leaders have used these three things in the past, you know, whether it is uh, the political leaders or business leaders. If they employ these three things, the, the Malays are always loyal to their masters. And this is what drives them to be. The, 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 pri the power distance index we talked about earlier is because of their loyalty. They are willing to be loyal to their, uh, to their bosses, to their leaders, and they will not question them, which is good and bad, actually. It is better to what uh, I will, uh, what Katz Devery will say, a healthy disrespect for your boss, rather than to be totally compliant 
but to be grudging inside you. And this is what uh, even Dr. Mahavir uh, mentioned in his uh, Malay dilemma as a problem with the Malaysians. They will outwardly will never be frank with you, even if they disagree, except with those with whom they are very comfortable, which is their own race, their own friends. The, the Malays are very frank among the Malays, but they will not be very frank with the other races for the fear of hurting them. And, and is that something which you would say is still relevant to the modern Malay in that sense? Because it's those, those sort of values sound very um, traditional, if, if, if yeah. I may say so. But do you think this is something that has even carried on <coughs> even to, till now? Of course, it's changing slowly, but still uh, the Malays have retained their values, uh, whether it's positive or not so good, but it is part of the Malay psyche. There is nothing good or bad about a culture, or you know, it is just that you have to accept it. Uh, in any culture, you 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 cannot be judgmental about whether this is good or bad. But uh, the Malays are slowly changing because of the urbanization, modernization, technological change, and uh, all these factors are pushing them or forcing them to change. And this is the biggest internal conflict that is going within the Malay and the Malay leaders. The Malays by nature, you know, the British have also uh, classified them as the nature's gentlemen. They are very nice people, they are very uh, encompassing, embracing, and they, they behave very well to any foreigner as long as you don't tread into some of the, the uh, sacrosanct values. Eh? And <clears throat> because of that, uh, but the modernization is forcing them to change a little bit. And the change comes slowly also. It is coming slowly. And there is a divide between the urban Malays, who I call the progressive Malays, and the rural Malays, who I classify as the regressive Malays because they have not come out of their regression as yet. So it is, it is an internal struggle. How much should, of my value should I give up to become successful in business? Uh, this is the internal struggle that is going on in MLA. You see, to be a successful entrepreneur or a businessman, you have to have a dosage, a right dose of narcissism, which is quite absent in, the, in an ordinary MLA. Malays are usually not that narcissistic. And narcissism is seen as a, one of the worst things for in a Malay uh, value system. Yes, yeah. value system. Mm. This it's, is it's all about uh, humility, as what you mentioned. Yeah, humility, exactly. In fact, on that point, you you actually uh, described some themes that uh, you said are uh, impediments to Malay leadership in business. And if I may quote you, mm. you mentioned uh, number one was Malay culture of feudalism, which has led to dependency and subsidy mentalities lack of experience and appropriate training, <coughs> politicians' desire to perpetuate the handout system which has led to corruption, mm -hmm. education that's not tailored to improve Malay acumen in business, inability of the Malays to compete with the Chinese <coughs> because of lack of adequate training and appropriate education, and misguided religious beliefs and conflicts. Now, I think all of this uh, warrants an hour each of discussion, mm. but would you like to like, pick out one or two from here and, and maybe you know, yes. expand further on that? If we can take uh, one by one, what is yeah. the first one? The first one was the feudalism. Yes. You see, feudalism is in the DNA of the Malay. And uh, it has been there because of 600 years of, of feudal rule by both the uh, royalty locally as well as the foreign uh, colonial masters. Therefore, Feudalism has been ingrained in the Malays, con both consciously and unconsciously. I did not realize how much the feudal values are still in the Malays until I myself was given the datoship. The moment people address me as a dato, you can see that the, the, the respect that is being given uh, to the title. So that sort of speaks of the, of the, uh, the unconscious uh, feudal mindset among the Malays. And then we are also extremely hierarchical. 
And uh, these are things which are good in a way because these are good values. The Japanese are also very uh, hierarchical, have respect for their bosses. And uh, in, in a way, in my expert panel, many of the experts did not want the Malays to give up these good values of, uh, of, the, of being uh, obedient, of being nice to their bosses. Otherwise, it, they feel that it may be difficult to manage them. But at the same time, in a multiracial society where there are other races who may not be fully in alignment with these values, although, of course, respect for elders is, is in all the three races, huh? we do have certain commonalities there. But still, feudalism needs to be a little bit uh, taken out from the Malay DNA, and a little bit of narcissism needs to be injected. But how, this is a very difficult question, and how long is a very difficult question, because you don't want to juggle with, with, the, with the value system of the Malays. Eh? So it has to take probably a natural development over the, over the coming generations, I would say. How about this? Uh, you, you mentioned about this uh, the inability of the Malays to compete with the Chinese, and it, and that raises a very interesting point. Is a Malay leadership trait mutually exclusive from what has been identified as a Chinese leadership trait? And being <coughs> Malaysia being what it is, are we seeing an interesting hybrid of leadership styles that is coming mm. out? Good question. But the hybrid style, if there is. Probably there is, but it is not well studied or well articulated. We do not know. There could be, but to me, if you look at what is happening in real life, probably the, the styles are very different. In the Malay leadership, uh, in companies or in organizations, or even in the political side, the Malay leadership is quite different from the other races. Uh, but if you see, the, the, the problem with the Malays is, as I have said, that they have not been given adequate training to become businessmen. If we look at uh, the training of the Malays to become professionals, if you want to become a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer, there is no shortcut. Whether it's a Malay, Chinese, or an Indian, you have to go through the, song, the normal uh, period of education to the universities until you become a doctor, and then you get your practical training, etc. But to become a businessman, the government made a very simplistic assumption that the only things that the Malays lacked was lack of opportunities, lack of capital, and uh, if we give them the licenses and provide them with capital, we make businessmen out of them. You see, if we, I'll give you two examples of how <coughs> adequate training and experience can make successful Malay leaders. Let's take the example of uh, Tansri Azman Hashim, who is a banker, a successful banker who has survived several crises, uh, economic crises, and made himself successful. Why? Because he started off as an accountant and started off as a banker with Maybank and then became his own owner, entrepreneur of M-Bank Group. Because he had the adequate training in, as a May Bank, and then he had the solid foundation, when he set up a set off on his own with, with M-Bank Group, he was successful. He had a solid experience and training. The second example is Tansri Samsudin of Sapura. He was an engineer in telecoms, and then he went. He was uh, invited by a Chinese partner to become a businessman in telecom, in telecommunication business. He started with the Uniphone. Those days, the coin-operated Uniphone was owned by Tansri Samsudin, and then he started uh, the when Malaysia embarked on a on a massive telecommunication project, laying cables and all that, his company was involved. Because he had a solid training as a telecommunications engineer, and he came out to do the same business, he became successful. 
So this is what exactly I've been my, by giving sufficient exposure and training. If we train the Malays in that way, and we are not in a hurry to make them entrepreneurs, over the period of solid experience backing them, they will become successful. This is also proven by my 360 degree feedback, where I made 25 senior corporate leaders to undertake some or four tests of my 360 degree feedback instruments. And I compared the results with the international database available at INSEAD and Hay Group. And I found that uh, although there were dissimilarities between the Malays and the international database, but the pattern of their leadership styles were quite similar. Giving uh, um, a, to a prelim, prima facie conclusion that when a Malay is given sufficient exposure, let's take an example of uh, Tan Sri Azman Mokhtar, who is the CEO of uh, Kazana. Before he assumed the CEO as the CEO of Kazana, he had gone through a very good training with UBS and some foreign investment banks. Therefore, when he took over as chair, as a managing director of Kazana, he fitted in well and he became a success story. Similarly, several of our CEOs in the GLCs who are doing extremely well have all had solid training before they assume, and many of them are seen to be successful. Uh, uh, but when there is lack of training, and you just ask, give them licenses and uh, capital uh, without back adequate training, then you see derailment in the Malay uh, business. Yes, you've, you've mentioned some success stories. In fact, we've also seen some uh, very successful business models as, uh, as have come out of uh, Malay leadership, in a sense, from Felda, from uh, mm. Tabung Haji, as well as PNB. Mm. Now, what are the secret uh, factors that has made it successful that you would say that is not typical amongst other types of leadership but mm. which you could actually point to a Malay leadership. What is that X factor that mm. you have seen there? Yeah, a very good question. I studied, you see, when I embarked on my research, I wanted to study the Malays from different angles. This is what I call the five levels of studying the Malays. First was the historical context. Second was the contemporary writings about the Malays. The third one was the focus group discussions. Fourth is the expert panel interview. Fifth is the 360 degree feedback instrument. And in the course of doing these five levels, I also had to do the cultural models of, about uh, Malays. So I took four well-known cultural models in, in the literature by Hofstad, Schein, uh, Trompenas, and Katzdivery, and studied the cultural models and applied it to the Malay situation. Then I found that the Malays were collectivist in nature, and they were uh, in the collectivist, and they were also, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, co collectivist or communitarian, communal. Yeah. communal okay, then. Uh, which is against individualist, okay? So this itself is, 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 is an indication that collectivism is, 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 some, is a factor that creates success among the Malays. So this uh, goes back to the Gotong Royan concept in the villages. So when the Malays engage themselves collectively in an activity, they all work hard to make success of the project. Therefore, the schemes like Felda, Tabong Haji, these are collective efforts of Malays pooling their resources together for a common objective. When that is uh, done, it is extremely successful. But when you ask the Malay to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur then there is a problem because it, is, it clashes with his value system of collectivism. The Malays feel very insecure when they, they are successful. Even the successful Malays feel that they are the only one, the lone ranger out there when the rest of the race is below. So this itself can trigger some psychological problems 
to derail them because they feel guilty inside them. Oh, my entire race is below. I am the only billionaire in this country or a few, maybe five or six billionaires. This itself can be a, a, a trigger for failure among those successful also. That is why you see waves of Malays who are successful, but they also fail after a while because they feel probably unconsciously the guilt feeling inside. But when all Malays are equally successful, then they won't feel that way. You see, I have noticed this even in, in a corporate environment. The Malays are not highly appreciative in the bonus scheme when there is a big disparity. You know, if the average bonus pool is, say, three months, and if a Malay gets 15 months, let's say, he feels not that happy. He feels a little bit guilty inside him. Am I being, uh, you know, uh, penalized in his way? It is not something that he, he'll be very happy of. He feels very unhappy that it should be uh, he is standing out on his own and uh, they are very happy when the differential is half month or one month so, so is this out of sync with the modern practices of performance uh, uh, you know performance related uh, incentives and, and reward system <coughs> yeah it is a little bit in fact uh, this is a very <coughs> what I will call uh, a magnanimous uh, uh, feeling among the Malays because they are not selfish. You see, <clears throat> in the American culture, it is okay to be selfish. You go and build everything for yourself. But in the Malay uh, culture, <coughs> collectivism is considered more important. Therefore, everybody wa they want everybody to be successful. Although that thing is changing because of modern education, but it's still very much the, the, uh, the unconscious feeling among the large segment of the Malays. Especially when in terms of when you talk about modernism with technology coming into place with uh, social media, uh, as well as also you know, transparency of information and mm. all that. Um, <coughs> do we see that the value system of the Malays we need to, to keep to keep in step with these very fast changes because you mentioned earlier <coughs> on we need time mm. but time is not necessarily on our hand. Mm. What's your views on that? You see, it is extremely difficult <coughs> to let go what you have even if it's dysfunctional. If you are used to a certain way of doing things you want to cling on to it <coughs> until you have an adaptive system this is why I have said in my research also, the government took a very simplistic approach that to make Malays as entrepreneurs is a technical issue. That means they lacked opportunities, they lacked capital, and therefore if you provide them with <coughs> some education, capital, and licenses, you can make a success of them. No, it is an adaptive issue. Adaptive means you have to unlearn some of the things that you, you have already in your, <coughs> your DNA. And to unlearn and to give up something, it is not easy. And this has been also written by a famous uh, cultural anthropologist called Lucien Pai, where he said, many countries in Asia have blindly followed the Western model of capitalism to make entrepreneurs, whereas the Asian psyche is made up more for collective efforts. And therefore, what we have done in Malaysia is, of course, as everywhere in the world, we adopted this entrepreneurial mode to make Malay successful without really understanding the Malay psyche. They are not made up for entrepreneurism. That is why the collective efforts like such as Tabong Haji, uh, Felda, Scheme, Bank Rayat, these are all uh, cooperative modes of making a project successful. Moving forward, do you think there is a role for the Malay leadership style in the future? See, after the collapse of the financial system in, in the US and elsewhere, people are beginning to question uh, the value system. Greed has driven 
the Western world to be compensated, you know, in a very unequitable manner. In fact, uh, even the EU Commission is putting a, a cap on how much bonus can be paid to banking executives. Huh? Uh, and as the system in the, uh, in the West has collapsed and is looking for answers, I think looking towards the East and the value system of the East, including the Malay value system, will be ultimately uh, admired. Because Malays have a good value system where everybody shares in an equitable manner. And this will, I think, sooner or later it will, it will be recognized and appreciated. And what is next? Where do you see your research taking you to part two mm. of this research? Which are the areas you, would you be uh, exploring further? Yes, I, I have in fact uh, put a chapter on thoughts for the future. You see, as I have said, the, because of the lack of opportunities from a historical perspective, that the Malays were never involved in business for more than 600 years. And only after the 1969 and the birth of the NEP, we are trying to make Malay businessmen successful. So we are talking about a 40-year period, although the original NEP was to run over a 20-year period, which I have said in my research that 20 years was definitely inadequate to change an entire race, which was uh, uh, suppressed for more than 600 years. And uh, my challenge now is to move on to the next level, which means how to bring the Malay race, which is in regressive mode. When I talk of the Malay race being in a regressive mode, I'm not talking about people like you, who have already come out of regression, or the, the corporate executives in Kuala Lumpur, who may number a few hundred thousand, and the professional class of Malays like doctors, engineers. These people have been successful through a proper education and they are all out of regre uh, regression into progression. But the large segment of the Malay society uh, is still in a regressive mode. And for that to, be, to, be, to bring them out of regressive to progressive mode, only one thing as all my expert panel and focus group discussion members mention education. That boils down to education. And I think many of my uh, expert panel members and focus groups have been highly critical of the current education system, which needs to be, to be looked at. This is something that we really need to look at seriously for the betterment of the Malays. Because you see, the Chinese are sending their children to Chinese schools. The elite Malays are sending their children to private institutions or international schools or overseas for education. So only the large segment of Malays who are unable to afford a high quality education are being subjected to uh, what is being provided in the system today. And that is not being fair to them because if we do not improve our education system to bring the Malays out of regression to progression, it will be taking a long, long time for us to, for the government to achieve its objective of uh, uh, the new economic policy. With that, we thank you very much for spending the time with us and uh, sharing your thoughts on uh, your research. And we wish you the very best of luck for your continuation of the research. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I'm very glad that you invited me for this discussion because the whole idea is to spread this message to how to make uh, Malays successful in the business. I did not want my research to be just lying idle in the libraries. So I really thank you for this opportunity. I'm Aliza Krialias, and thank you very much for joining us in the ICLIF Leadership and Governance Centre the Leaders' Room. Thank you.